Ooh. All right, well, welcome everyone to uh, our first live Alco Hour. Um, bear with us, thank you for your patience if the uh, AV is a little new to I think everyone, but um, our speaker will be here at the mic uh, and everyone else who's in the room with me will have their laptops. So I'm hoping um, we can sort it out by having you turn your video on and I will bring the microphone over to you and then we can do questions that way. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy to uh, have Jacopo here to talk to us. He is um, Director of AI at Covio, which is uh, a B2B um, service um, that does, well, maybe I'll have him explain a little bit, um, but active in the MLOps community. And thanks to Stefan uh, Krachwich for uh, making the, the connection. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Got it. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Like people here and people far, it's kind of a first time that I have this kind of weird, like, you know, um, like so close, but so far also experience. Uh, please, if you have any question, feel free to interrupt me at any time, uh, like either through a chat, I know you guys have a Slack or just unmute yourself if you're on Zoom and ask questions. I'm totally fine with that. Uh, thanks again, everybody for having me here, in particular, Stefan and Natalia for organizing. So today we're going to talk about uh, recommender system, which hopefully is a topic that is dear to you, or at least to, to some of you. Um, and our talk, um, I mean, it's titled Beyond NDCG Behavioral Testing for Rexis with Tracklist. It's a community-based project. So while it started at Coveo, we're going to discuss a bit why we started this project. It also involves other nice folks uh, uh, they cannot be here, but of course, you know, they share exactly, you know, the same, the same, um, you know, ownership on this that I have. Um, and so without further ado, uh, let's jump into the talk. So uh, as Natalia was saying, Coveo is a B2B uh, company, is publicly traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And the important part about this slide is not so much, you know, this kind of, you know, marketing vibe out of it, um, but is that the fact that Coveo is a B2B company, it actually sets very different constraints and definitely different challenges compared to normal people doing recommendation. You want it may be, you know, Amazon, Walmart, and so on and so forth. Um, in particular, and then we're going to see it uh, in practice, it's very hard to even have one good recommender system that actually works like it's supposed to work. Imagine if you have to train dozens or hundreds on website that you don't control fully or on different verticals with different traffic, with different constraints. And so this is the situation that we are in as part of Coveo. So as part of the AI Coveo, we need to develop models that are not just good and that they work, but they're really robust across a variety of use cases that are very, very hard to find you know, somewhere else. So this is important because it's like a fundamental part of our motivation. So what we believe that you know, what we present today is kind of applicable to anybody involving recommender system, or even to people just doing recommender system for research. It actually born out of a very practical reason of us as a B2B AI player in the space. As part of the AI Coveo, uh, you know, if you guys follow, um, especially e-commerce tech, um, you probably have already the misfortune of hearing my Italian voice, um, you know, in, in most of the top tier conferences in this space in the last couple of years. Uh, we got about 50 minutes of celebrity last year by winning Best Paper and Knuckle, um, as we're, you know, at the heart, we're NLP and language people. And also we open source, when we can, we try to open source as much as we can, uh, not just our code, but also our data. So last year, we organized a SIGA Yard Data Challenge. And as a result of that, we released the biggest e-commerce data set of all time in session-based personalization. So if you guys are interested in session-based inference, please check it out. Of course, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's free and it's still open even after the challenge. So let's go to recommender system, which is the main topic of today. Um, so recommender system are super important. And you know, everybody here, is, I, 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 I feel really is, you know, um, uh, one really question the statement, um, but even us as a general shopper, like we find recommender system in basically every part of our of our life. Um, and there's like reason to believe that a huge component of like how people like a brand in this digital era is about how relevant you are to this brand. Like, you know, how, how, how good is, how personalized you are, like, you know, how, how you speak to their heart and intent in the moment. So a lot of people will actually just leave your website if you're not good with recommender system. And that's a good part. As in recommender system are super important and we should really devote a lot of our effort into this. And what is the bad part? Is that testing recommender system, I mean, testing software is hard, 
testing machine learning system is harder. And then, you know, testing recommender system is may possibly even, you know, even, you know, one of the hardest challenge that we may have for all sorts of reasons we're going to get into. And if there's one thing that I want you to take home from this talk, one thing only is this one, the way in which we usually evaluate recommender system with what we call pointwise metrics. So this magic number in a table in LaTeX for your paper that tells you that, you know, this is likely better than this one is a terrible way to measure how recommender system actually behave in reality, okay? Not because it's a better way per se, but it's just because it's one tiny component of what we expect this model to do and which type of failure mode that this model actually encompasses it. So if there's one thing I want you to take away is not using our open source library, do whatever you want with it, but the motivation I think stays really uh, clear and kind of like speaks to both the research community and the industry community. So uh, everybody is his own story. Everybody as a user really find no relevant recommendation, like kind of every, every turn of the way, even in super major player, like even a recommender system that works super well, you know, super state of the art, they're still gonna get you some time to what are kind of like a very dumb recommendation. So these are two examples. And again, I'm sure you're in your life, both as a practitioner and as shoppers, you kind of find some of this. So, you know, you have a job recommendation for a guy that is a CTO, and the job recommendation is, well, you should check this work as an executive assistant. And why I always joke that if they see my code, that's probably a good recommendation for me, in general, as a terror recommendation for CTOs. Um, on the left, you find a slightly subtle mistake um, as it's not a bad carousel. Actually, it's not super bad. Like there's a bunch of boots there. But if you read the fine prints, you find some of these are actually for women. Some of these are for kids and some of these are for men. And it's extremely unlikely that somebody's you know, shopping for all of this at the same time. What is funky about this is that if by random chance, the user actually click on one of these boots, what the model is thinking is, well, I did a good job. I actually got a click. You know, this carousel was actually amazing. Well, the experience can clearly be better. And again, the, the crucial point we're trying to make is there's nothing in the way that most people, certainly us, usually treat recommender system validation um, that actually takes into account any of this. So yes, recommender system fails silently, but they do not fail randomly. That's kind of the crucial point here. If recommender system failure was completely random and without any single pattern, there was no point in trying to test them. Like they were just randomly failing. And a crucial insight of working with the recommender system, in particular with e-commerce, but not just in e-commerce, is that there are some behavioral principles, what we call, that can be enforced and that are kind of independent from the particular nature of the recommendation. And we're going to see here two examples of like typical mode of failure. So one, which we know very well, you know, in the complementary item case, I know guys, maybe is the similar thing to your outfit problem, okay? So you have one item and then you need to suggest another item that may complete the first item. So an important point is like, let's say you have a TV that is $600 and now I suggest you an accessory of $6, like a HDMI cable. That's a great suggestion. That's a great complete the basket type of thing. But now, if you're buying an HDMI cable, that's actually a terrible suggestion to you know, up, try to upsell you a $600 TV. And the funny thing is that your test set may not ever have this case like that, right? So this point is not about that this, this thing cannot, you know, cannot happen in reality. Of course, this thing can happen in reality. But A, your test set may not have this case. And B, even if he has it, this error may be confused just you know, without other errors with no kind of like clear explanation. So there's an asymmetry here that we want to that we want to kind of like enforce, which is the exact opposite that what happens with similar items. Like, so if you, which is typical called substitute recommendation in e-commerce, right? I have a t-shirt and I want another t-shirt that is similar along, you know, like some relevant dimension. And then we were discussing before computer vision stuff. Like if I have a Latin representation of t-shirt, you know, on the left and a Latin representation of t-shirt on the right, they're actually very similar visually. I, you know, they're, they're kind of a good suggestion. But then when you take into account that one cost, you know, $50 because maybe it's Nike and the one is like Gucci and it's like 500, again, that's actually a terrible suggestion. It's extremely unlikely that somebody, you know, buying a Nike, shopping for a Nike t-shirt will actually end up buying an, a Gucci one and, and vice versa. And so the fun thing again is even when you actually, when actually models work, you actually may get a very, very kind of like you know, um, warped uh, representation of reality of their behavior. Let's take Federico, for example. You know, Federico is really likes from romantic comedy. So, and he watched The Big Sick in January 2022. 
And then we know in the test set, so we know that, you know, in the held out set, you know, Federico actually watched, you know, when Harry met Sally in February. Now you have model A and model B and you want to test them on this recommendation problem and you ask them to produce a carousel. And both models actually get the right, you know, get the right, get the target item in the second position of this, of this, of this, of this, of this uh, test case. So by any metrics, you pick it, iterate MRR and DCG, these actually models are actually the same model. But obviously these are not the same model. Like the first model is obviously much more terrible than the second one, right? So the first model is another Meg Ryan movie, for example, but it's completed along a dimension that is completely not, you know, as part of what the target item is. And there's no way for us to distinguish between model A and model B using standard metrics. So the question we ask, and we ask it to ourselves again, like, it's kind of like, you know, starting what, you know, <laughs> watching what we do is not like, you know, what other people do first is like, do our tests really capture these nuances and these issues? And the answer is, well, actually, no, not really. We have error analysis, we have debug patterns, but it's all spotty and kind of like this ad hoc thing that you do mostly when a customer complains. You know, when somebody picks up the phone, it's like, hey, well, we're recommending a TV when I just buy an HDMI cable. It's like, oh my God, yes, that's actually a terrible idea, but honestly, we didn't know. And so, you know, and then you kind of chase them. And the question is, instead of chasing them once you deploy, can we kind of prevent them in some way before deployment? So behavioral testing, for those of you who are not familiar with it, we surely were not before reading this, this paper by Microsoft last year, um, is, you know, a standard way of testing system that you treat as a black box. So the idea here, instead of having some, you know, uh, held out prediction cases on a test set and you measure some accuracy, whatever that is, what you do, you provide input output pairs to the model and you have an expected behavior to the model. So you know what the model should do. You don't care how it does it. You just know that it should do and you should respect some principle that you want to enforce, okay? And then you check what the models do, okay? The fact that this case is the crucial part is that some of these cases may not even be part of the original test set, as in the slightly different use cases, but you believe for whatever reason that it kind of really captures some of the behavior that the model wants to do in production. And so there was this very nice, nice paper by Microsoft on NLP, um, like last year, like two years ago at ACL, it was best paper at ACL, um, and introduced this concept of a checklist, which is, well, we have this large pre-trained model for NLP, but do they really work? And to set you know, you know, themselves to answer this question, they start with some typical behavioral testing. And let, let's take one example. We don't go through that, to all of that, but let's take the first example. So it's a template-based system. So it's I am a protected and noun kind of template. And then you can fill these lots with whatever you want, okay? And of course, if you fill it, let's say in this case with black woman, you expect what is the predicted sentiment? Well, neutral, like this is just a statement, like there's nothing, there's no connotation to it and so on and so forth, right? And of course, I mean, as you may guess already since you're part of this community, well, that works in theory, but then when you actually test models, like state-of-the-art models on this, actually they fail on many of these patterns, even spectacularly. In fact, and that was kind of the conclusion of the paper is that we boast for BERT-based model or some cloud APIs, including Microsoft, you know, you have, you have to give it to them. They're very honest, including Microsoft own API that we market as sought accuracy, or in some cases, even close to human performance on this very, very narrow classification task. And then when you come up with this, you know, super stupid syntax swap or template swapping and so on and so forth, most of these models basically are unable to actually produce a behavior that you will deem in some sense desirable, okay? And so there are two insights from this paper. One is behavioral tests are cool, as in when you actually unleash something into the wild, you really want to supplement your test set in a quantitative sense, with something that is more nuanced and is more captured, again, what, what the desired behavior of the system is. Second, preparing behavioral tests is kind of a pain in the neck. Like imagine writing down, I am a protected now like a million times to do that. And so what they came up with was a nice software package that kind of helps you scale it up, okay? For language, it's kind of easy because all English models are the same. So the fact that there's a large pre trained models is very easy, for example, to template that to a reasonable extent. So for recommendation, we're going to see it's not, you know, it's not that straightforward, but it's kind of this idea that behavioral tests are good and necessary, but also if I leave individual developer writing individual tests, they're never going to get out of it. Like they're going to spend months doing that. So we kind of need to help them with good software practices and, you know, some good defaults and some good way to scale them up. So these are the two messages we take from them. And what we did, we did exactly the same. 
That's why it's called Reckless. Like it's a, of course, it's a direct homage to them. And even the title of the paper is exactly the same with, you know, is a templated, like it's actually with the word swap. And we're, we're really, we're really glad that we get the paper, but we did the same with Reckless. And of course, we need to change a bunch of stuff. Again, recommendation system, a large model, large language model are very different. But we kind of wanted to get people the same kind of like feeling and the same kind of you know, use cases. So we started with uh, laying down three of the most common recommendation use cases that we came across in our, in our life. They're not exhaustive, but they kind of already encompasses, I would say, like the majority of like, you know, what people in the recommender system community actually think of when they say recommender system. So the first use case is similar items. We saw it already. Like you have a t-shirt to one another t-shirt. You have a pair of sneakers to one another pair of sneakers. You are in media. So you're watching a movie. I want a similar movie. Awesome. Complementary items, which is very, very common in electronics or as you guys know very well in fashion, which is most of the outfit thing, right? I have a, I have a bag and I want a pair of shoes that goes with it. Okay. And then finally, which is more of kind of like the recent couple, most recent couple of like years in the especially research community, are the so-called session-based recommendation system. They're not so much identified by the nature of their items, but they're identified by the type of feature that you actually use. Uh, in particular, session-based recommender system are kind of using super recent data, like literally what the user has been clicked in this session to kind of suggest what is gonna be the next interaction for, for them. So they treat recommendation more as a sequence problem if you want the technical part, than the usual you know, user item kind of two tower embeddings if you're in the deep learning part or matrix factorization if you're like, you know, more in the previous generation. Session-based is more, this is a sequence problem. And in fact, most session-based recommender actually turns out to be transformers in one sense of the other. So, and what we want to do is we want to list some behavioral principle, again, some things that we deem desirable that our recommendation do, irrespectively of the fact that A, they're represented in our test set, okay? And B, that we need to deploy a recommender system on Remember Covea, we have hundreds of sites on site A or site B. So this principle needs to be somehow abstract enough to be across you know, use cases, okay? but somehow concrete enough to make sense for people to say, hey, this is a good principle for recommender system. So behavioral principle one is use cases have some sort of like formal properties that is like um, kind of independent from the target catalog that we have. In particular, remember the example we made with similar and complementary items? So what is the point here is that similar items are really substitutable items, meaning that they share the same taxonomy, whatever your taxonomy is, they share the same type of object, okay? And they share many of their properties in you know, whatever dimension you deem relevant, okay? For example, remember the mistake, they should probably share, roughly speaking, also the price dimension, not just visual attributes or you know, the category and so on and so forth. Complementary items have actually completely opposite formal problems. Outfits are tricky, and we can go to that. But let's say electronics, let's start with electronics. Complementary items in electronics are typically fairly asymmetric, meaning that the price, so the price of the first item tends to be in, like way bigger than the price of the second item. Um, and then of course, it tends to be in very different categories. So if you have a, like a complementary recommender system for typically add to cart example, uh, or odd outfit, and the key item is a bag, the chances of the prediction item being a bag is basically null, right? That's a very, very, very bad thing to do, okay? And you'd be surprised by, you know, like maybe, or maybe you won't be surprised, but like that actually happens, you know, like many, many, many times. And so the way in which we can actually do this is that instead of a conceptualize our test set as this kind of like abstract rows of like, hey, this user actually picked item ID number one, two, three, we actually join all the properties of the item and soon all the user with the prediction that you can make. So now every prediction actually carries over all the metadata of the items that are involved. And so you can kind of make this kind of principle analysis of what goes on and so on and so forth. So behavioral principle number two, some mistakes are worse than others, okay? So when we actually do recommender system or in general machine learning models, okay? And we have this it or miss kind of metrics, it means you have a golden standard, let's say, Federico really watched when Harry met Sally, and then you judge a system based on the fact that he actually get that or not, okay? But that's not really what life is, right? This is not really what the experience of Federico is like when he actually goes on, say, Netflix in this case and try to watch another movie, okay? In particular, if you are wrong, so if you don't get the right items, there are some items that are still reasonable, 
Uh, there are mistakes that we deem, okay, you know, this is not the right one, but it's still, still something that Federico actually may have, in a counterfactual world, is this something that Federico might have found actually, you know, like plausible. Like, for example, in this case, a uh, you got mail. Sorry for this old 90s reference that my, I'm really old. I, I, I realize this, everybody mocks, my, Chiro mocks me all the time because, uh, sorry, completely stems. Like when, when I teach to my MIU classes and of course people like, you know, my students are much younger than me and all my jokes, all my example, nothing, nothing really rings a bell in any, like I have to change all my slide next year because, you know, all this kind of like Simpsons and Futurama thing is not, is not really cool anymore. Uh, but yeah, but the, but, the, but the point here, which I think everybody, again, as a recommender, like, Think of the mistake we saw in the beginning, like maybe from a CTO, maybe suggesting a lead data scientist position is not the greatest, but it's way better than executive assistant, right? Like one is something like, eh, I don't know. And the other one's like, well, this is actually a different job. Like it's a very different type of being, of being wrong. And if you think of the type of things that we consider as good metrics for generalization, like it rate, there's nothing is capturing to that. Like there's none of this thing is built into this idea that you, what we call being less wrong. It's fine to be wrong. You can be right all the time, but when you're wrong, you seem to be reasonable, okay? And we have completely orthogonal, but we, we wrote a paper at Rexis like two years ago now, when we showed that this problem is especially acute for cold start items. So when the recommender just not, do not suffer from the problem that cold start items are very hard to, you know, to suggest and kind of position in the Latin space, but when you're wrong on cold start item, you tend to be, you know, funnily wrong, okay? And so the experience of the people in the long tail, it's kind of like super deteriorating, but way more than your numbers is actually gonna tell you, okay? And the third behavioral principle, of course, is that, you know, you should slice your data because not all the data is the same. Not just not all the errors are the same, but also not all your data points are the same. Um, I don't know about guys, about you, Citrix, but in many, many websites that we saw, and surely that's true also the Spotify data set. It's true also the movie lens data set. The consumption of items in the digital era is a huge power law. So few items accounts for the vast majority, like almost you know, the entirety of the interaction. What does it mean for people building recommender system? It means that if Netflix improve a tiny bit on improving blockbuster movies from Marvel, a tiny bit, they're gonna get a better MRR even if they're in the process of doing that, they destroy the, view, the viewing experience of people that like Italian movies from the 60s, which are like, you know, me, Chiro, and a bunch of other people, okay? But of course, since, we, since that part is so small in the, in the overall test set, you know, you will never catch it. And this is an example we're gonna discuss later in commerce, like let's say you have a multi-brand e-commerce, so you, are, you have suppliers, which I guess applies to you, and maybe you can improve, you know, marginally, whatever metrics you care about, by kind of destroying one supplier inadvertently, of course, like just because you don't know, but maybe because you, you do a bit better on two that are very common, okay? It's not the job of Reckless or our job, of course, to tell you what you should do. Maybe Netflix can go ahead and destroy the life of people that really want Italian movies because they really prefer you know, Marvel movies, whatever. Our point is we want this to be A, a discussion that people have. So the trade-off needs to be explicit. And it needs to be very easy to create this chart. Like, there needs to be zero effort from an organizational point of view to be able to make this discussion happen, okay? Then the outcome of that discussion may depend on your business, on your, strate on your strategy, on your philosophy, whatever you want. But we want to provide people with a shared lexicon and kind of a best practice, you know, so that when they run our code, our code is not just code. The code of reckless is the end of the day is trivial, but it's kind of a way to put into code what we believe are, you know, a good way of discussing about this, okay? So we want for people to make easy to discuss about this problem. So before talking about how we solve this, I want to pause for like literally a minute or whatever. So literally was really a wrong adverb here, like for a minute uh, to see if anybody has any questions so far, any clarification either here from the live audience or like from afar. Or maybe somebody wrote in the chat, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. So all good? Okay. So the solution to this, well, the solution. 
our initial solution to this, um, but again, I, I, hope, I hope we all agree about the problem. Then we can disagree, but I would be very happy if we disagree about the solution. Um, but, but yes, but I really want us to agree on the problem. But our solution is Reckless, okay? And it's kind of like our open source library is, is really a small library, um, but it kind of takes all of these ideas and put them into something that people can use uh, and hopefully can, can, use, can start using very quickly. We have kind of three pillars. So Reckless is an open source project. So is built by people in the community for people in the community. So, you know, you can, you know, send MIT license, you can do whatever you want with it. If you want to collaborate, please, you know, um, join us. Uh, if you want to fork it, use it, do your own test, do whatever you want. Um, it's also peer reviewed. So Reckless is gonna be a paper at the upcoming web conference. So while again, it started as a very, very practical problem for people in a very large and fast growing organization like Coveo, it actually, we think is actually very useful also for researchers. Because again, you know, the next time you go to Rexis and there's a table when there's, you know, this four model, one is in bold and there's like, you know, this HR or MRR or whatever, what does it really mean? It's kind of like up in the air for people that then actually need to, need to, need to, need to uh, take action from that. And of course it's community based. It started at Coveo, but it's already part of like, you know, some, some people from academia, some people from other startups. Um, and we hope this community, you know, will, will, will grow larger, um, you know, as the time goes. So Reckless is built out of a few main abstractions. So um, they're kind of like, you know, simple Python classes that kind of makes um, different recommender system to some extent compatible in a practical way. So of course, data set first, as in you need to have a way to tell Reckless, you know, what, what data set you have, which you're testing on. We start with a bunch of data set you can already download. We're going to see the cola, but if you, if you get Reckless today, even the alpha, there's already some wrapper around three popular recommendation data set that people use in the community. So Spotify, MovieLens, and Coveo. Um, there's a rec model abstraction, which is a class that actually abstracts your model. Okay, remember that in black box texting, we do not know what's going on in the model. And also we don't want to know, which is cool because it means that, for example, you can use Reckless to test API, like, you know, like Microsoft did in their, in their paper. They have no idea how they work internally. Okay, as long as you wrap the prediction of this API in a common interface, you can actually test models. They have no idea how they work. Okay, and of course, the main important, the most important thing is the reckless itself class, which is basically, and you see here, um, it's kind of like a declarative style. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Metaflow, but it's kind of really rem like reminding of, of Metaflow, which is, which is something that we really love. Um, and it's just a combination of Python function. Each of one is decorated with this rec test decorator. Okay, and then we're gonna see how it works. But the idea is that, you know, this class define all the tests that we want to run on these use cases. And then what the program actually does when you, when you run this class is gonna take the model, is gonna take the data set, and is gonna execute all this function and keep track of what's happening for you. So before doing this, I want you to show you. So the, um, the public GitHub repo has a bunch of stuff already, the paper, a presentation, a bunch of documentation and so on and so forth. But there's also a collab. So if you want to test Reckless and you don't even want to do PP install, you're very, very lazy. You don't even want to clone it at PP install. You can actually use the collab version if you just want to see how it works. And I think it's better to go through this, um, to the actual code um, instead of like slides um, to actually understand it works. So the idea is that, you know, you import some stuff, but then you have this, you know, Nice wrapper. So you pick your data set in this case, okay? We're testing a recommender system doing add to cart. So our use case here is the complementary items recommendation, okay, that we discussed before, okay? So you can just instance in this data set, which again, in this case, the cover data set, Spotify data set, movie lens is right there on abstraction, which is gonna be downloaded for you, okay? And then if you want to inspect it, you're gonna have, you know, this, the train and, and test plate ready. In this case, you know, um, you see that this uh, is a session, that is made by three events, okay? And each event is this, you know, metadata in particular. This event is about this SKU and it's a detail event. So it's somebody that they watched, did, that, that actually saw this product doing S and Y. So this is the, you know, the original, you know, data capturing product um, process, which is what, you know, 99% of commerce have. Um, what you do is that you define a model, which again, if you want to use one of our model, you can just use, in this case, this is a skip run model we provide you. Of course, if you train your own model, please you know, bring your own model. But if you want just to start with something that is like a decent baseline just to see how it works, you instantiate the model, you train it on the 
on the data set, okay? And then once you're ready, you take a pre-made breakfast uh, set of tests that we prepare for you that is that we know it work well for this data set and for these use cases, okay? You pass in the two things that you need, the model and the data set, of course, and then you run it, okay? And once you run it, here you don't you don't see the pictures and a bunch of other stuff that we produce, but you just see like a log. But what you see here is a list of basically tests that describe what happens in the test and then tells you, you know, the you know the results of, of, of running like certain tests. Some of these tests are the usual tests you're all familiar with, like H, you know, like it rate or coverage at 10. Some of these are this more kind of like behavioral type of thing. We're gonna see that like distance to query or its distribution and so on and so forth. And before diving into the meaning of this, I just want to tell you how easy it is then to extend what we give you to whatever new test you want to run. So let's say you really like this add to cart use case you're working on I don't know, an out of it problem and you have your own data set, but you feel that you may want to add any other test, but you like the one that we wrote. So what you do, again, a super simple abstraction is composable. So you just iterate from our main abstraction and then you define your own test. In this case, of course, it's a stupid test. And the only thing that it does is like selecting a random products from this, from this catalog. Okay? And then you actually do the same. You instantiate the library and you run it. And it turns out that you run exactly the same as before, plus, you see here, plus the result of running your own test. And whatever things you document here in your, in your library is actually going to come up here as your description for the test. So it's very, very easy to kind of like extend what we build for your use cases or, you know, build a new track list from scratch, depending on what you, what you need to, what you need to do. Let me, sure. I have a question on um, how specific is the, the specification of the, of the, of the data set? So are those um, the keys, are those all the time the same? Can they be arbitrary depending on the website? Yeah, so the data set now typically has two things. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. So the question was, uh, like Christopher Natalia was like, how specific is the definition of a data set? Is in just like, there's a certain key that always needs to be there, or it just works for certain type of webs and not others, and so on and so forth. So a very good question. So the short answer is no. There's only two things that you should include. One is, you know, your typical extreme white, you know, your typical split for, you know, for whatever training algorithm you have. Um, if you're training a model, if you come with your model already trained, you can avoid even the training part. You just have to have the test set, of course. Um, and the other thing that we suggest you to do, of course, depending on which type of test you want to run, is the catalog, or in your case, would be the inventory. Okay, which is is a simple a dictionary that is as a key is as an ID for the products, which needs to be the ID of the things in the prediction side. So the ID here is what people predict on, and then you have any metadata you want as a dictionary. Okay, and by doing that, then you can specify what slice of data you want for the analysis that we're gonna run or what is the price column and so and so. So it's actually pretty flexible. What is missing right now is the user representation. As in now we don't support you to feed us user metadata, which is totally like a, like a trivial extension to this. Is like when you declare the data set, now you have a key, which is the user ID with metadata. And now everything you can do by slicing and done and in doing that on the item, you can also do that on user properties. Okay. So makes sense. So what happens here? So you again, like you pick a use cases and then you pick a data set that you want to use, or it may be your data set, maybe some of the data set we provide you, whatever you want. Uh, you pick a model, maybe a model in our library. There are very few, like it, they're just very baseline. The point of the library is not building recommender system, but they're just there for you to start. Or you build your own model. You train it if you didn't train it on the website, on the, sorry, on the data set. And then you can either use a pre-made rec list because maybe the rec list that we made is already good enough for you. You can build custom tests and supplement our own rec list. For example, like the one that we, that we, that we saw. Or you can build your custom rec list, you know, basically from scratch. So for example, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with NVIDIA Merlin um, um, open source recommender system, it's a super nice recommender system initiative by NVIDIA, okay? So let's say you have them, you, you, you want to fork their code and you want to, to train on the Coveo dataset and you want to run a reckless. So this is the kind of like logical workflow. So it's a, it's a cart recommender system. 
you can use the public data set that we, that we give you. You're going to train your own model. In this case, let's say NVIDIA Merlin open source model. You train it on the, on the, on the covert data set, and then you can test it on our checklist. Okay. If you put this all together in code, which is what we saw in the call up just in different cells, but at the end of the day, is this simple? You pick a data set, you pick a model, you train it if you haven't trained it before, and then of course you run your checklist. And that's kind of all there is to go from zero to your first checklist that it, that it actually runs. And if you want to have a custom one, as we saw, exactly the same, you inherit from something that exists, you run a custom, you add the custom test, and then you run your own. Okay. We like to think of this as kind of like, I know that this is like a super inflated metaphor in MLOps, so I really apologize for this. Um, but yeah, we kind of think of this like, you know, this kind of Lego box things, right? So, and the first, like, which is a very, very minimal, many minimal uh, like commitment is that you have your own model and you can use, you know, our directly that we build and that's say we build and you can just combine them together to get results. Like, you know, like the NVIDIA example, like this is level zero, okay? And then, or level one, if you want. And then level two, you know, you bring your own model, but then you start adding some of your tests, right? Like we saw in the example. So for example, in the outfit case, you may realize that some of our complementary um, behavioral tests do not really fit the fashion case. And so we want to add your own, okay? So now your final result is a combination of the original checklist, your cases, and your model, okay? Or, of course, you can build anything you want. You can scrap all the rec lists that we, that we give you to you. And you can just use rec lists, which I think is maybe the, ma the major value as the interlocking system, as kind of the place when you have this discussion, as the shared lexicon, this kind of like, you know, what we call best practices through code, as the, you know, as the moment in your stack, and then we're going to see where, where you actually have this discussion about how a commander system work. And then you build all your tests and all your model, and you kind of just use maybe the reporting tool. Maybe you just use one tiny things of this whole thing. But it's kind of the fact that it's there now forces everybody to kind of sit down and decide, wait, what is a good measure for this use case in this recommender system? So what can you use it for? Um, two main use cases. So for researchers, for people that are actually trying to improve the state of the art, or maybe the people there as part of their job are trying just new algorithms, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be that you want to publish a track list, okay? Um, but it's good because you can kind of, you know, use um, pre-made uh, data set that everybody's benchmarking on, and you can benchmark your model against, you know, other models you're trying, not just from the HR, MRR, and DCG perspective, but also from whatever thing you deem is important. Not just from a number point of view, not just because you want to get better numbers, but because you want to understand the mode of failures of these models, like where the, why this model is better. Is it better because it's better in blockbuster movie or is it better because it's actually more homogeneous in the long tail? And in production system, of course, you can imagine. So when you run Reckless, which you haven't seen that because it was a collab, but when you run it in your like actual run it, um, you actually produce a lot of like, not a lot, like some machine to machine communication. So all the results of the test get structured in a JSON that then you can imagine being part of your whatever CI CD or whatever pipeline you have to bring modern in production. For example, again, as a B2B player that we trains like dozens, you know, thousands of models every day, you know, there's always some accuracy check before you want to release a new version of the same model on target deployment A. And you can imagine a world with reckless, you know, uh, it's kind of part of the way in which you think about recommender system that you have also some tests that are not just pure accuracy. It may be, you know, the Italian, the famous, you know, Italian people that loves Italian movies kind of like check. And then again, it's not about to us to tell you if you have to stop the deployment because of that or not, that's your decision. Um, but we want to build a tool that makes this, all of this like pretty, pretty easy. I think, yes, we were perfectly on time. So I just want to conclude that work out example of like, well, this is all nice and well, but does it actually work when, you know, when you actually test with a recommender system on a real use case? Uh, the short answer is yes. And you know, the, the, the slightly longer answer, not super long because the paper was four pages, so we couldn't do much, but like the slightly longer answer is, is in the paper. Um, but I just want you to walk through like a real use case in e-commerce on how to use Reckless on two recommender system. Um, so um, if you see this, this table here, there are two models. We're just gonna consider two of them. One is Prot2Vec which is like a skip gram kind of like uh, model um, for recommendation. And the other is Google. Google is in the Google API that you can just, you can go on Google G GCP and you can just do that, right? So we kind of replicate this vibe of the original Microsoft paper of like having open source tool, 
like Protovac mm -hmm. and cloud providers. Okay. And if you look for standard metrics like you know, eat rate or MRR, this model is basically indistinguishable. Sure, Google is like, you know, Google is a tiny bit better, but it's really, really hard to make anything out of it. And again, if there's one message that you need to like this, this benchmark is done only for comparison of, you know, reckless. Right so this, you know, don't really trust this if you're really making a decision between these two. But what we're trying to say here is that there are going to be many cases in your life when two models are indistinguishable by these metrics. But now we're going to see their behavior is completely different. And then again, decision is for you, but we want just to highlight that. So the first thing that you want to discuss, because we kind of brought it up several times, and I think is a huge problem in recommended system, is the long tail behavior. So for example, you see here the Google model mostly outperforms, you know, uh, Proto, like Protovac in the very, you know, as you know, in the very, very frequent products. So in the analogy of Netflix that we made with movies, they're kind of doing better because they're very good at blockbusters, right? But when you go to very rare items, actually Protovac is actually superior to the, to the Google API which again, this thing is impossible to understand from the table that I showed you before. So if I ask you, you know, where Google shines and you know, where, you know, where, where Protovac shines, you will be able to do that. If not by doing a doc analysis or writing a doc code and so on and so forth. If you want to slice data, uh, again, to understand that, you know, different data points actually have different like weights in how the model actually performs. This is an example. So this is an example on a multi-brand um, shop. So there are multiple suppliers for this shop, right? And as you see here, again, like, you know, the, the performance on Nike is kind of the same, but the performance on Adidas, Google shines way more than, than Protovac. Why is this important? It's important because, as you guys know very well, you want suppliers to be taken fairly to some extent or, or not, depending on the period of the year. They may be that this guy has a Facebook campaign on Nike shoes in this moment, for example. So you really want to make sure that the Nike experience is good or vice versa, the ASICs or the Adidas and so on and so forth. Um, and again, it, we, we, we kind of reckless, it's very easy to kind of generate this plot and kind of, you know, you, you, you have to tell the model, of course, because that's on you, that's your domain knowledge, which slice you care about. In this case, maybe brand or whatever it's called in the catalog, but then everything else has been taken care of for you. And finally, going a bit more fancier, you know, if you, if you want the detail, look at the paper, of course. So this is at, at the distance in the Latin space. So. Let's say you have a way to build the Latin space of products, okay? Whatever you can use, you can do Skipgram, you can use, uh, I don't know, ResNet. You can do, you know, lately we've been working a lot with Clip. So you can do fancy stuff with Clip or whatever it is. But you have a Latin, we have a way to, to say which products are closer to the other in the Latin space. What we did is we plot for Protovac and for Google, the distance measured by the cosine distance in the Latin space, okay? Between the um, um, item, the, the predicted item and the, um, and the query item, in the gold standard, so the blue case or the orange case, what the item predicts. Remember, this is a recommendation uh, for add to cart. So diversity here is to be somehow desired, right? And in fact, if you look at the actual blue distribution, which is the actual labels, you see here that you know the target items tends to be kind of like you know distributed to different length from the actual query item. But then when you look at the behavior of prot to vec, most of the recommendation of prot to vec tends to be kind of narrowly you know, around, you know, some of this, some of this, um, um, uh, items while Google seems to be do a better job in the variety case in this use case. Okay. And of course you can swap in, you know, like whatever Latin space you have in this case, I believe it's still Skipgram. Like, so you just, you know, build that whatever you want. And the cool thing is that you can do it also for features. For example, you may want to see what brand affinity your, um, or designer affinity, your recommender system actually champions. So for example, we had a talk with um, a very famous, super gigantic e-commerce and they said, you know, a problem we have with watches that sometimes there's a Rolex and then sometimes we suggest a watch or even a counterfeit, okay? And, and the point here is that there's a subtle thing. So of course there's a Rolex, maybe another Rolex is good, but, but also an Omega is a good suggestion. So this kind of affinity that Rolex to Omega is much closer in the in the Latin space than you know than than in the Rolex watch or to watch or whatever, and so there's a very easy way to generate also brand embeddings if you want to do that or whatever embeddings you you care about. So what are we doing now? So uh, well, so we we release it I think end of last year, kind of silently, but we start talking about it like in January, and we reach out to a bunch of. Um, you know, friends and people that we know in some of the best recommender system teams 
um, you know, around. And so we collect their feedback. The private field can say, hey, this is what we like, this is what we don't. We got our paper accepted to the web conference. So if you guys are there, again, you will have the chance of hearing, again, my Italian voice one more time. No, I think Patrick is also, you know, actually you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna listen to somebody that actually speaks English. That's awesome. Um, and now what we're going to do now in this spring tour, so we, we're kind of like starting for the first time publicly. And thanks so much again, guys, for, for having us here um, about this. As we as we want to collect like kind of more unfiltered and feedback than just you know private private events, uh, we're also going to be at Nvidia GTC next week for for those of you that go to to the Nvidia to the Nvidia conference, um, and then we're preparing. So we're now calling, with all this feedback, we have these roadmap documents, of course, as you can imagine, and we're preparing to go back and write like a second version, which is going to be a beta version, much improved thanks to all the feedback we collect, which way way more features and so on and so forth. Um, of course. If you want to check it out on GitHub, uh, please do. Um, if you like this talk, or even if you didn't, please give us a start. It costs like a second and it helps us like share, you know, the library and kind of like share the love. Um, and of course, if you really, really like this talk, if you didn't like this talk, don't, don't, don't get in touch. But if you really, really like this talk, uh, please get in touch. If you want to contribute, we're actually looking for people that want to work with us at the beta. Or if you have use cases, Maybe you don't really want to work actively on this, but you think that this may actually help your work. We're super happy to have a, like a workshop with you and sit down with you a couple of hours and say, hey, how can we make this work in your use case and help you write tests and so on and so forth. So we did that for a couple of, of companies and it works very well. And for us, you know, it's just more people that adopt this and kind of like, again, spread these ideas in the community that I think hopefully would be beneficial to anybody. Uh, there are people in the B2B world like ourselves, but also people in the B2C world that are kind of like a direct relationship to their final, you know, recommender system consumer. Thanks so much. And, you know, if you have any question, please let me know. Thank you. I had a question in terms of um, most recommendation systems aren't a single one. So in our case, for instance, you have uh, our recommendation system that comprises multiple services. Um, uh, in the code that you showed, I guess, the thing that I'm thinking is you just switch out a model for an API call to web stack. Is that how so I'm going to just repeat the call, the, the, the question. The question is, a recommender system in many, 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 many uh, real cases are done by combining together different services or different calls or like kind of like these complex pipelines that at the end of the day, sure, spits a SKU or a product, but it's kind of more complex than just, you know, integrating like a like a simple Python package or something like that. So the question is like, how can you use Reckless with that? So there are two to answer to that. One is the runtime version of Reckless, which is what you see here as in, yes, if you have an API, like if you deploy your model in your dev, whatever, what Docker, whatever it is, and you have an address to that, and you can kind of like wrap around the API as you would for Google API. You just treat it as a pretty data black box. So that's one way of doing that. But that may be fairly slow depending on what you're doing. So another thing you can do that needs to be perfected is that you can actually prepare the test. You can prepare the prediction in whatever prediction stack that you have. Let's say you have like a super, we have this request, like a super accelerated GPU stack somewhere else. Then you prepare a million of prediction on the test, and then you feed the prediction directly in Reckless, and Reckless is going to calculate all the metrics. Why I'm saying this is half working right now? Because it's working for all the rec tests that do not involve a runtime creation of new tests. So for example, your price homogeneity test or the latent space, it's fine. You can, you can basically feed the prediction as they're done before. But let's say you do a perturbation test, which we haven't seen here, but if you, there's a Spotify example if you want. right? There's a playlist recommendation case. And the question we ask is like, what if we slightly perturb one, one song? You know, how, how bad that's going to change what, what comes. And of course, to perturb one song, you actually have, you know, that's not in the test. That's not in the original data set, right? So in that case, we need to improve our API and kind of make a smart way of like knowing which tests can be run at runtime and which nets can be somehow cached and then you can run. Like, so this is kind of the, 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 the real distinction here is like, is the test creating new test cases or not? If not, you can already do it with, just passing the, the the prediction. Yeah. I guess follow up to that because um, if you're testing, say, the actual system part of uh, real life, inventory state changes. Yeah. So the test start wouldn't necessarily wait to be valid. So yeah. I guess uh, uh, you would then incorporate that somehow with the API that they're for generating the test to say this is the scope of SKUs that are actually available today. 
so the question was like following up, if you do this on the monitoring, I think there's a monitoring tool, not just as a diagnostic tool, like when you develop stuff, things keep on changing. So if you eat the same API, you run the same test, but you have the same API in one hour, you know, between the, this, when you start the test, and when you end the test, then maybe they actually, some of this could actually changes. So that, that's a very good point. Um, so in this, this has been thought for a world when you can always, when kind of like things can be frozen at a certain time, meaning that there's a version idea of what are the two main items here, which is data set, which comprise catalog and behavior or user, if you want. And of course, models. So if you want to do it as a real monitoring tool, you have to kind of be super aware of like, hey, but then when we run it, so you run it every hour or whatever, every day, you need to run it on a very type, like, you know, specific type of things. And then how you write the test is also a big component to it, right? But that's, I think that's, a, that's an analogy with unit test. Like if the unit test is super narrow, it also may break as a false pot. You know, it may break for reasons that are not really kind of right. But if it's too broad, it may never break and, you know, it just always fine. But that's kind of like, you know, in the heart of like, how you test the system. That's a, like, one thing that we want to kind of indirectly say, like being good at machine learning it involves a lot of domain knowledge. Like building a good recommender system in like design fashion or whatever, it probably got to entail you looking at, you know, thousands of output before kind of get an idea of what's going on, right? This idea that now I, I, you know, I download like the, you know, TensorFlow Rex, and then I press a button and that's going to be fantastic. It's kind of not what happens in reality, right? And so all this domain knowledge, it can either be used spot, like in a spot fashion or ad hoc kind of analysis when something goes wrong or is on, you know, like, you know, on fire, or you can kind of try and kind of embed all this knowledge in smart things that sure, it takes a bit of pain to write at the beginning, like, you know, but no soft, but was like, no software packages, certainly not reckless. That's gonna take away your work. Like you have to do the, the hard work, but hopefully it's gonna give you a pleasurable experience and a one-stop shop for everybody, including PMs and maybe less technical people to say, hey, what's going on? So we haven't seen this, but a component of reckless, which needs to be drastically improvement, is generating a documentation automatically for things that else. So we're already in contact with other people in the MLOps community, like you know the people at Metaflow, the people at Comet, so people that have experimental tracking dashboards, and they really want to have, for example, well, why can we have like a more, like a more nuanced evaluation of our model, or you know Metaflow cards, which you know we co-developed with with the guys at Metaflow. Like, why don't we have a section in the Metaflow card when you're on a pipeline that kind of visualize this for everybody? So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of this that philosophic allows to our own team more general idea of like. There's a lot of domain knowledge that goes into build good machine learning system at the end of the day. Um, but that domain knowledge needs to be kind of like formalized to code. Like code is a way to structure your priors and your you know, inductive bias into that. And it's better than just lights because codes can be version, guns can be run at scale and so on and so forth. But in the end of the day, it's not gonna be different from what a slide is. It's just actionable, actionable English in some sense. I don't know if that makes sense as a as a general roadmap, but yeah. Any other question? Anyone online? Oh, sorry, yeah, I'm super bad with this chatting thing. No, just anybody or, okay. I have one. Sure. Um, I was curious, as you've been developing this, and uh, have you noticed um, that there's a lot of looking at you know these different slices and yeah. these different sites have they been able to have like impact on the business bottom line or is that still more just is the value add more to just have a better intuitive understanding of what the recommender is so for the question for b2b people is tricky because you know there's always two levels here there's the bottom line there's our bottom line it is we develop in recommender system and then there are people that actually use them what we can say is that Reckless is being used also internally at Coveo to benchmark different initiative of what a good recommender system is, okay? Because Im imagine that like, you know, the company's like, you know, it's like a thousand people and, you know, everybody has a new idea of like what could be a cool recommenders and there's a lot of technology up there. The company's already good at developing that, like, you know, doing research and so on and so forth. So sometimes somebody has a new idea of like, you know, we want just to say how much do we need to invest in this? And this is for the first time kind of like a good... I mean, we're already a good quantitative metrics, but now it's kind of a more you know rounded evaluation of what we do. 
but also through the API trick. Now we can also compare Google recommendation or Amazon recommendation. And this is important on the second layer that I was mentioning, which is our client, right? Because at some point in your sales discussion on your customer support discussion or whatever, somebody's gonna tell you, well, but also Google does it or also Amazon does. You know, that's kind of the conversation at some point you have. And you know, there's this there's way to understand the strengths and weaknesses of this that is more objective than just a slide. Um, and so now I think we can use this tool also to kind of have a more informed overview of the landscape, like really the entire landscape from Alibaba recommendation library they released like last week or PyTorch Rex that was like last week or whatever uh, to our own models, our own research or even cloud providers, which are getting better, honestly, right? So for people like us, it's always good to know, you know, like who's doing what and, you know, what is the marginal effort or the marginal gain to be continuously improving this when you know other people are also doing super cool stuff that maybe we can leverage. Um, so yeah. All good? Thanks so much, guys.